Yeah. Like things on the jar. <laughs> Are you trying to make the longest name? Just don't know what to call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then in flower, we've got some stuff we picked up at Purple City Genetics. We've got the Molotov cocktail, the blue limonene, and the green guava. Uh, we're doing a pico hunt on some genetics from BioVortex, which is a G mob, which is the GMO times black dog SFV times hazelnut cream. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it can get better and better. We, we just popped some Z seeds. We've got a Z3, a strawberry shark, and a banana skittle that we've got for Chino over here. Uh, yes, sir. And then we're trying to just get into some more you know, hunting and getting into more of our own in house genetics that we've made over the years. Fucking savage. That's fucking amazing. Do you guys want to have any response to anything else you guys are growing? Like you guys both resonated on the on the Z process that Eli No, the bio vortex that Eli Eli has or bio vortex. Can I get the black dog that says not that one? That's a Jesse Jesse makes yeah, Jesse makes some amazing genetics. <laughs> I'll hold it a little closer. You're saying the black dog. Yeah. Black dog is a, a it's a blackberry 707 headband times big butt. Just old school shit. Yeah. But everyone talks about it, and I don't really feel like I see it in jars just yet in the stores, like bio vortex strains, like, you know, with that label and all the fruit. Yeah, there's not he's, he's like the man behind <coughs> There's not a lot of them out there that I know of on the black market. We have the Gorilla Food Black Dog, uh, we call it Gorilla Dog number four. Uh, so we have some of that. We actually have some of the milk from it here tonight. So 159 through 120 head. Well, Sorry, say that again. Uh, we've got some of the milk from it here tonight. Oh, here. Ooh. Ooh. Here. Is it? I need a jar. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought we'd uh, talk taxes or actually prices for a sec. What is the MSRP for a legal jar of of living soil like at your guys' grape? Uh, what should what do you want to see it going for? Just to you know be real here. As far as like what the consumers? Yeah, like what should it be before taxes at the counter? For each of you, go. Fifty to fifty five bucks. Okay. <coughs> Should go back to the farmer's pocket, uh, but yeah, I think we should work for them. We're not, we're not 
big corporate owned uh, entities. Guzzling soil scale. Sorry, everybody else, feel free. Oh no, I was, I was just gonna say it depends on scale. I think like I wouldn't be opposed to operating something on a truly large scale. I think you could even increase what is currently the lower tier shelves quality significantly and maybe be competitive at that price point and still save money potentially. Um, but I think for you know people who are interested. I, that, that sounds that's I love the sound of that. Like more amazing weed at lower price lower price. Yeah, I, I mean I still think there will always be the market for you know the top shelf no till staying at the top being above fifty dollars a week and hopefully maintaining that because you know, we have seen it. I, I mean I've seen it get I guess Colorado whatever the top shelf ounces you can get sometimes for as low as like three hundred or something like that. So you know there are like Californias that you could still it's still a little bit higher and I think that living soil will hopefully stay above it even as more and more people are growing. Top shelf in general, like what? So, forty dollars jar of a bomb ball in living soil. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping California will stay above fifty for the bomb bomb living soil, and I hope that you know people will be willing to make more cheap, more cheap living soil. I know that sounds funny, but it's just it's just a matter of if it's not living soil people doing it, it's going to be people doing it the wrong way, generally speaking. And at that scale, it actually does have a lot of harm. In your mic. And calling it building. Oh well, well, yeah, they do that too, for sure. But I'm just saying, like in general, I think it would be great for living soil to take over some of that lower tier shelf because even if it's um, cheapening maybe living soil to some extent, it does mean that the mass scale farming that's done is to some extent biodynamic, regenerative, helping the planet. And, uh, yeah, you know, Eli, you got man, you're doubling space over there. <laughs> Wake up, Eli. In Sonoma. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with the whole scaling thing. It is possible. I've, I've seen it done in the wine industry. You know, there's there's very small amount of time. You know, like, if you look at the well, grape. Sorry, there's a very small amount. Speak louder. It, it's fine. Yeah. So, you hit, like, maybe your fist underneath your... your Just put it right up there. Like, right there. 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 That's your media training for the day. Make your fist. That's the distance. All right. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now, it's like we're on, on pillow next to each other. Uh, yeah, I think that you can totally scale living soil. It's It becomes more difficult when you're doing it indoors because you're still needing to use electricity and lights and you know, just all those things that come with the overhead. So it's hard to really drop costs super low. You can do it, you know, you can produce really low price. Um, living soil and greenhouses and outdoor and stuff like that, which is all regeneratively grown. Support those people that are doing that. Um, but yeah, I think for the cost of the overhead, especially where we're at in Sonoma County, it's, it's, it's expensive. You know, electricity is expensive, real estate is expensive. Um, it's just more difficult to drop the price of that. Taxes. Taxes are very expensive. I didn't want to bring them up and bum everybody out. You know, like, well, uh, for everybody. For but it sounds like you're saying there might be an indoor ban and an outdoor ban for living soil growing jars. Yeah. Where do you think that outdoor ban of living soil growing jars is gonna be at in five years? Five forty bucks forty bucks a jar? Like is it scaling? Is it ramping right now for outdoors? Yeah. Twenty, twenty five. Okay. 30. Well that's, that really gets to the next question. That was money. That always sucks. Let's talk about the soul of living soil. Um, let's talk about definitions. Like, what is is living soil like? Have an association where there's a guy who's like, you can only do it this way, and that's what's called living soil, um, or not? Where did this term come from? Like, when did you guys pick it up? Um, but the first question: Define living soil. Is there different definitions? Living soil is a lot. You know, there's there's a lot of diversity in soil biology. You know, there's compost, there's more microorganisms within like a cup of soil than there are people on the planet than you can look at it with a microscope. You can see all of that. Yeah. Um, As opposed to rock wool, bottle nutrients. Yeah. Or soil that's just kind of like an inert medium, essentially like a carrier, like a medium that's getting a bunch of salt based like fertilizer. Uh, Christian Nani, go ahead. 
Uh, living soil is uh, something that's full of life, clearly, but um, from micro to macro organisms. So you're talking about everything that you can see under a microscope from you know nematodes, protozoa, amoeba, um, different kinds of bacteria, and then all the way up to uh, worms, to pill bugs. Um, you know, since we're indoors, that's probably like the biggest organism that we deal with is probably a worm or a pill bug. But yeah, uh, full of diversity. Diversity is key. Yes. Within the the organisms as well as the different plant species that you're both cultivating with your cannabis, so you're not just cultivating in a monocrop system that's all weed and soil. Do you? I think they summed it up pretty well. I'll just add that, like, I think there's obviously like I'm just curious. Do you guys consider like biodynamic, like just creating a living soil, but like using it once? Do you guys consider that living soil? Great question. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah. Ask. So um, I've been kind of this. We just ran a piece on Weekly called like, "What is living soil and why do they keep putting on these goddamn cannabis awards?" Uh, and um, one of the things that came up was like, you have people doing no-till beds. Uh, there's dirt in there. There's been dirt in there for years inside. Uh, all these guys are inside. I wish there was a girl on the stage. Next time. Um, and um, you're not tilling. And then other people are doing soil inside, but they're taking soil in and then using it once and then it's going out the back door. And so there's soil growing inside and it's a lot when it's there, yeah. but it's not cooler, which would be like a no-till project, which has all these environmental components please so, so i i just feel like i see a lot of people branding doing that as living soil i personally would think it's more related to no-till where you know we're really enriching the medium once and then using it at least for multiple cycles and then you know so i'm yeah that's what it means for yes and no i mean i know someone up in washington uh, justin <laughs> mcgill uh he takes his soil out after every harvest. And what he does, I would consider the real soil because, uh, I mean, he's adding either, you know, a compost extract or compost tea. He is adding life. I think what we're doing, we're building soil. Like we're starting off with a soilless media technically because it's so high in organic matter and amendments. It's not, it doesn't have the same characteristics of a native soil. So yeah. it's technically soilless, and then over time, we're building soil. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I guess we're no building soil. Yeah, because we're not using any kind of machinery to you know, physically uh, till the soil. We're, we might be using our hands to like scratch in amendments or something like that, but the goal is to not disturb the soil, or as little as possible. Yes. Go more on that, Eli. Like, where did you learn? <laughs> yes. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I got into. Yeah, oh, wait a minute. How old are your beds right now? Sorry. They're just pushing two years right now. <laughs> and I, so this, guy, this guy's going to put stuff on the top all the time, right? Yeah. You yeah. Know, I mean, we do, you know, we grow different plants that will get chopped down. You know, we'll grow them just quickly to cut them down and let them mulch back in. And yeah. Um, you know, we have like the top two inches layer of our soil is just. Look like pure worm castings. Um, so yeah, it's you know we've been cultivating all kinds of different plants from like carrots and radishes to different flowers and uh, cherry tomatoes and all kinds of different things, strawberries. Uh, Underneath the weed plants. Yeah. That's so fucking cool. I want I I crop carrots. Do you eat the food that you grow in there? Yep. Yeah. Market. Said, yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. 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 You're trying to demand so much out of the soil, you know, so much yield four or five times a year. So 
So we're testing the stern ledger around and adding in a fair amount of uh, like top dressing and that means. Just because you know we're trying to hit certain metrics and you know, because you got boats like that, you gotta be able to still get so much material out of every run. Yeah, we also use different uh, amendments that we top dress with as well as we make a lot of pretty natural farming inputs on site with things that we're also growing in our canvas beds. Um, we our, our head cultivator Josh, his father in law has a small farm at his house where we collect different fruits from the orchard. We'll collect some fish scraps from the Bodega Bay from the fishermen. Uh, we'll go out to the ocean and kind of complement that. We do a lot of green apple farming stuff kind of as a as a way of putting back a more kind of like pre digested source of nutrients. Uh, yeah. Coming from plants that we're making on site. Um, how did you guys learn this stuff? Is there textbooks? Who are the luminaries of living soil? Who should we be reading? Um, I was always a big fan of mountain organics, personally. Um, his, uh, at least his blue jay and Branson forms. You said mountain organics? Mountain organics. Um, and uh, his new blue jay and Branson forms. He was one of the original no-till um, soil, I would say, Celebrities, at least on the forums, <laughs> you know, like I, um, I, I've actually cultivated um, a friendship with him over the past few years. I'm, I'm growing lots of strains right now. I think I forgot to mention that that's the one, which is the 1971 uh, Kandahar Afghani with the 1976 Highland Pie. The seed was caught 40 years ago, and he's been he was gifted the cut from another uh, kind of remote underground guy named Clackamas Coop. Um, who's kind of been out of the scene for quite a while. I, I, he's, he's kind of older, so people don't know, know really where he is. But um, either way, I learned a lot from them when I first started. Um, and then watched a bunch of YouTube, obviously read you know, the classics, even the microbes. Sorry, let's hold on the classics. Which channel a couple, what was the classic? Uh, teaming with microbes. Teaming with microbes. Um, which honestly, when I read it back then, it blew my mind. And then I do a lot of things differently as I learned more from some of those things, but um, I would definitely recommend Jeff Lowenthal. It's like a, a good introduction to the living soil world, and I think he really explains it in a way that, you know, just gets you thinking about agriculture in a totally different mindset, and then obviously if you want to go deeper, you know, there is what to do. And then uh, for me, our method, um, we use heavy decomp. With heavy decomp. Yeah, which means, um, which is, I think differs from both of them. We like use a thick mulch layer. Um, we found that to keep soil really going for like a five, six plus year period and be healthy. Indoors, having just a heavy amount of composting happening on site was very, very helpful. Damn. And uh, part of what inspired that was the one straw revolution that we read um, through months and over for It was one yeah. straw revolution. Great book. Yeah, that's very probably, inspiring. Like for no-till specifically, I would say Masanobu Fukuoka's uh, books are definitely a must. Some of them are really cryptic and hard to understand, but at least the one-star revolution, I think, speaks very clearly to people, and um, you have the whole ethos of why this method is so groundbreaking. And, and we actually follow more of a style similar to him. He had somewhat of a, he, he was a microbiologist in a, a prefecture in, uh, in, in Fukuoka, um, in Japan, and Basically, he had a love at being a microbiologist and eventually becoming a no till farmer. He had like a very, I would say, um, weird relationship with science at the farther he went down the no till system, where a lot of people would come and do soil tests and by him, and they'd be like, Oh my god, you're missing all this phosphorus. You're, there's no way you're going to yield the same amount. And he'd then grow rice that was half the size of the chemically grown rice, comes with all the um, phosphorus, yeah. and but it had double the amount of kernels on it, or whatever it is. So he actually yielded the same exact amount per, you know, square foot meter, or whatever. Yeah, he he was yielding the same exact amount. Um, so, although I do believe in soil testing, we do do it occasionally, not as much. I try and go from the bottom. I I kind of yeah a bot a bottom down process where I take the end product, which is the bud, and I try and learn from how it's responding to my environment, more or less how I should treat my soil. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how we do it. Uh, it seems like everyone tests a different amount. Eli, you were saying you didn't even test for the first year? 
Yeah, we didn't test our soil for the first year that we ran it. Um, the lab came back and said everything looks very well balanced, and yeah. that's just doing what we're doing, and that was just and based on intuition. It just strikes me that that's um, so ballsy in an era where people are measuring the electrical conductivity or the pumping runoff, and like they're just like over here turning the knobs on every like wash, and you guys are just setting it, and it's just got set, and then it's but you know it's you're getting enough good inputs and you're getting the right outputs, and so it's working. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. It's, it's and you were saying Masanobu Fukunoko? Masanobu Fukuoka. Fukuoka. <laughs> Who's got shout it out? What is it? <laughs> What's the right? Fuku. Yeah. Fuku. Yeah. Just type in one straw revolution. Yeah, one straw yeah. revolution. One straw revolution. Yeah. One straw one straw revolution. Do you co sign on that stuff? Or what books sort of turned you yeah. on? Those books, um, I didn't find those books until later on after kind of the research that I was doing. Um, I worked in the wine industry doing mechanic work for uh, some of the biggest biodynamic grape growers in the country. Uh, Mike Benziger and Phil Curry. Yeah. So I worked in their repair facilities, basically managing their repair shops and building different implements for the biodynamic farming that they did. And so I got kind of like firsthand knowledge and watching them making the preps that they're making and applying to the vineyards. And I started trying to apply those to the to the grows that I had where I'm like running rock wool and salts and spraying some like micronized quartz crystal that's been buried in a cow barn over the equinox or something like that. And it, it just wasn't quite all well meshing together so I just stripped everything out and went full on with living soil and studied a lot with um, like the stuff that Master Cho did with the Korean natural farming stuff. Um, Nasty. Making basically fermented plant juices and extracts that are full of nutrients and minerals, um, as well as cultivating and propagating micro and indigenous microorganisms. Um, studied some with uh, Lane Ingham, like learning kind of like her methods of composting and how to use a microscope to see that your compost is actually kind of putting in what you want in there and not filling your compost full of like pathogenic pathogens. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's the most of what I've kind of studied in a lot of trial and error. And you all use different lights. Every one of you use different light setup. Shout out your light setup. I mean, if you don't mind sharing a little bit. Sure. <laughs> you can be vague. You can just be like. Uh, we use CMHs currently. Um, so I'm, 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 yeah, I'm switching to a combination of HPS and CMH. I do have a lot of experience with HPS prior to that. Um, but yeah, I just. I feel like CMH is in the right setting, in the right settings, to be very advantageous. They are though very low humidity plants, generally speaking, so they're better for places that you want to keep a little cooler, but still get a great impact. You two are other two are on LEDs, right? Fluids. Uh, we have the fluids as well. <laughs> so, so, you know, you brought up a good point about how kind of like um, no-till and and, uh, and uh, living soil kind of changed your whole thinking about ag. Let's end there. What has growing living soil, like how has it changed you and your outlook? Like how do you go shopping at the store knowing what you know about the soil cycle and everything? Like, uh, it's a big dumb question, but are you guys like rabid, like organic composters? Like, uh, do you have a big compost in your backyard too? Like how has how it changed your life learning this shit? <laughs> I wish I had the like, time the to, uh, to compost more, but. Uh, I mean, you try to be reasonable and practical. Obviously, it changes your perspective on, you know, where your food comes from, absolutely. And uh, that's kind of what we want people to think about, too, when they try our wheat, for instance. I want to inspire people to either shop differently, whether it's for food, or just try to be more sustainable in general, whatever that looks like in your life. Um, you know, I think that's super important. So I, I don't think I'm crazy about just I do shop organic because I know how pesticide filled all our food is and how it's poisoning and killing us, but yeah, yeah. Eli. Yeah, I, I prefer to eat organic foods. Um, it, it is difficult knowing where, what processes are in these big, even organic farms and the things that they use, um, but it's, yeah, it's pretty complex to know. Just shop at a grocery store. Um, so we, yeah, we try to buy it 
I'll help you as far as we can. I try to clean those as much as I can. I have a warm mint, basically. I have a black and yellow tote that I've been putting my food scraps in for like six or seven years. Yeah. Um, so I, that, that works really good for the home food scrap type of stuff. Uh, we make a lot of compost at the facility. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, it sounds like you've aligned your life with the no-till philosophy. You understand, like, there's no future in salting the earth, with, right? I like to believe that I try my best to obviously be as organic as possible and whatever I can. Uh, I would love to grow all my own food if I had like a space for it. Um, my, my business partner in eight grows all his uh, own vegetables in his backyard uh, with living soil. So he doesn't really go to the grocery store for the vegetables, which I think is ideal where you want to be either a community garden, something really local where you're actually seeing input. Because honestly, it can get even even with stuff certified organic, it can get pretty bad out there. Um, but I also order from DoorDash sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we're back. I think we're at time. We're at time. Thank you so much, members only of Chronic Culture, for joining us. For this